Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to Escape from Tibet. Uh, this is an event organized by the Center for Cultural Identity and Education, the CCIE, um, and co-sponsored by the Department of Educational Studies here at UBC. So I want to thank all the folks that helped to organize all of this, uh, especially the staff, the staff of the OGPR, um, including Joanne O'Connor, who's behind um, uh, the camera there, um, and also EDSD staff, um, especially Michael Masucic, um, who's done a lot of work to help to organize this. And um, we have our own departmental head here, actually, Professor Ali Abdi. Uh, my name is Handel Wright, and I'm the director of the CCIE, and it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, renowned documentary filmmaker Nick Gray and uh, one of his documentary participants who's known by the name Tenzin, not his real name, but um, his research name, uh, to UBC. And this is part of a book tour that they're doing um, across Canada, and I believe they'll be going on to Ottawa from here as well. Um, their visit coincides um, with the visit of the, um, uh, His Holiness, uh, Dalai, the Dalai Lama, um, who's having several events in Vancouver, including at UBC. Now, I've known Nick for, I was trying to count, some 16 years now, <laughs> but mostly tangentially through his wife, Anne Gray, who is a prominent cultural studies scholar and was head of the Department of Cultural Studies and Sociology at the University of Birmingham and one of the co-editors of the European Journal of Cultural Studies. I spent a sabbatical year at Birmingham and was book reviews editor uh, for the European Journal of Cultural Studies for several years. And as an editorial team, we would meet in England um, at uh, Nick and Anne's home. So that's where I got to, to, um, to know Nick. Uh, when I found out that he and Tenzin were coming to Vancouver, I seized the opportunity to invite them, and they have a really busy schedule, and at first it didn't look like this was going to work out, but they've been very gracious in working us into um, their itinerary. So I'm delighted that um, Nick and Tenzin have made time to come to UBC to discuss Escape from Tibet, um, both the documentary film and the book, which, by the way, has a, a foreword by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now, something of a more formal introduction. Nick Gray has been a documentary filmmaker um, for some 40 years now. He was um, one of the founder producers of the British TV flagship documentary series First Tuesday, and he's made uh, 20 films or so uh, for the series over 10 years. He was the original divisor and producer of the hospital series Jimmy's, recognized as the first combination documentary soap opera, or docu-soap, as they call it in Britain, on television. Uh, he has made programs for the BBC, for ITV, channels 4 and 5 in Britain, as well as for National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. He has made films all over the world, including Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, Haiti, Peru, Paraguay, Mexico, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. His programs have won many international awards, including the BAFTA and the International Emmy, and um, have been honored by the Vatican, the Church of England, the United Nations, and Amnesty International. And many of his films have been screened in festivals and cinemas. His film, Escape from Tibet, won plaudits um, all over the world. The critics said, by turns heartbreaking and horrifying, this is documentary making of the highest order, and called it an astonishing, emotionally gripping film. Uh, since 2007, Ms. Nick Gray has been visiting professor in documentary production at the University of London. And now on to Tenzin. Tenzin comes from northeastern Tibet, the region where the 14th Dalai Lama was born. His father died when he was very young. His mother had a tough time bringing up Tenzin and his three brothers. From an early age, they all had to help out in the fields, um, etc. Now, prospects for Tibetans inside the country are limited, mainly subsistence farming, um, etc. So, his oldest brother, Pan, uh, Pasang, 
um, persuaded their mother to let him take Tenzin away so that she would have one less mouth to feed. Together they would try to find a better life outside Tibet, uh, somewhere where they could freely practice their religion and improve their prospects. Tenzin was just 11 years old at the time, his brother was 19, um, and they went through what he thought would be a great adventure, but turned out to be a grueling and sometimes very dangerous journey. Escape from Tibet tells the story of what happened. Together they faced lots of um, problems, and, um, and Tenzin suffered frostbite and snow, snow blindness. Um, the two brothers are featured in this award-winning documentary uh, made by Nick Ray, uh, which has been shown worldwide. As a result of the film, Spencer, sponsors came forward to finance the brothers' move to London, England, where they now live. Um, only now do they feel that the full story of their daring escape can be told. Tenzin is in the final year of an undergraduate degree at the University of Westminster in London studying Chinese and linguistics. Um, so I don't want to say much more. I want to hand it over to them. We're here to listen to them and to speak with them. So without too much further ado, please join me in welcoming Nick and Tenzin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Handel, for that uh, fulsome introduction. That's very good. I thought I'd try and uh, uh, address some of the issues that you might be more interested in, according to what Handel has already told me, uh, considerations of the, the politics of representation and uh, sensitivity to the researcher subject audience power dynamics. And, and that, although uh, uh, it, that sounds uh, very um, long words and that sort of thing, but uh, 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 interesting definitions, but it's in fact something that we uh, addressed in making. The, the kind of documentaries that uh, I like making uh, for uh, for television, and um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the uh, research process happened uh, in, in terms of the um, film, and uh, and how we developed the relationship with uh, with Tenzin and his brother and the other refugees that we filmed. We're actually here doing this uh, book tour as Handel said, because uh, this book has been now published by a very astute Canadian publisher from Toronto, who I've just had the opportunity of meeting, because I, I hadn't met him before, I just talked to him on the phone, and uh, he, he took this, um, I'd already published it, uh, this uh, a book, um, uh, this story, in England, um, and I published it myself, and um, in a limited edition, which uh, sold out. Uh, we sold over a thousand books, which was very good, and uh, we sold sold out, and it didn't even go into the bookshops. Uh, we went around showing the film and uh, uh, talking to groups, and um, and that that way we uh, we sold the copies. But one of those copies uh, did find its way to uh, Toronto. And it was picked up by Anik Press, and Anik Press decided to, to go with it, but to give it a slant, really, more for the younger reader. So it's aimed at uh, uh, the younger reader because these, the, the, the two people it's about were young brothers, and that's what appealed to uh, Anik Press. But the, uh, so they're giving it um, a fair win by inviting us over to. Uh, a session here at the Writers Fest in, in Vancouver to give us an opportunity to come to Vancouver for the first time and uh, also to Toronto where we're going to be on Thursday and Ottawa next weekend before we fly back because uh, Tenzin has to be in class on Monday morning I promised his tutor uh, he'll be there although he would have been in the aeroplane all night I think so anyway um, just to Go back, though. So, so uh, as you say, um, uh, as I say, it started off as a as a film. But um, the only reason that we met uh, was that uh, I had this ambition to to make a film about human rights in Tibet, and um, uh, and we met entirely by chance. And it was only by chance that the two brothers became the most significant figures in the film. 
Um, more news gets out of Tibet these days, but when I made the film, there was very little about the Chinese oppression of Tibet on television. And there were very, very good reasons for this. You couldn't actually go to Tibet and film people criticizing the government or criticizing uh, or, or describing the treatment they had, uh, torture, uh, imprisonment, and that sort of thing. Um, you couldn't uh, show that on television because they would then get in trouble um, and their families would get in trouble. And uh, you would have to then film undercover and not show people's faces. And that's not something we wanted to do. We wanted to show people's faces because people have faces. And that's, what, uh, that's the way to engage the audience. And it would be unfair to take their faces away from them. And, um, so we, it was very important to us to, to try and work out a way of telling the Tibetans' own story uh, without the limitations of um, not being able to show their faces. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the people who had appeared, had appeared in one or two interviews and that sort of thing, had been imprisoned, they had been tortured, some had been driven, driven into exile, and we wanted to avoid that. Even those who had helped Western journalists in Tibet, uh, like innocent travel agents, had been uh, rounded up and imprisoned. I, we actually met one of them, didn't we? A, a guide who had been put in prison uh, for um, taking some people around and uh, showing them things that um, the, the Chinese government thought was a bad idea to show to Westerners. Uh, and they had been subjected to imprisonment and, and torture. So we wouldn't be able to uh, film people very easily, but we wanted to tell the, the Tibetans to tell their own story. Um, so it was an important issue to cover, and uh, we really needed a foreground narrative to follow. But in the course of research, I found out something which I thought was very interesting, uh, which is that every year, hundreds, nearly thousands of Tibetans uh, climb over the mountains, climb over the Himalayas to find freedom in uh, mostly in India. Uh, some of them go over and then go back but they want to see the, uh, the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader uh, and they want to have a, a, the opportunity to uh, uh, visit the monasteries in, uh, in India. And that evoked an amazing uh, picture really, an image of people climbing over the mountains, uh, refugees climbing over the mountains, ill-clad, Ill ill-prepared, and um, uh, in a very dangerous place because the Chinese border guards can capture them, uh, they can shoot at them. There's a celebrated case where one was um, a 19-year-old uh, nun was shot by a border guard up in the mountains, and it was filmed by a Romanian cameraman who was there as a mountaineer. And it got, they managed to smuggle the, the uh, tape out and show it on the internet. So that sort of thing happened, uh, and still does happen. Um, so uh, uh, it was a really good image, and I thought that it was really important that we could, what we would try and do, I devised this idea that we would try and go up to the, top, to the top of the mountain and wait for a group of refugees to come over. It seems crazy now. Uh, and, and then ask them whether we could film them and then continue filming them down the, the other side of the mountain through Nepal into India and uh, all newcomers into, uh, into, into India from, the, uh, from uh, Tibet can see His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So we would be able to film an audience with the, with the Dalai Lama and then just follow their progress and then after that to go secretly undercover into Tibet to film the background pictures uh, to illustrate their stories so that we wouldn't necessarily show any people there and they wouldn't get into any kind of trouble. Um, we would disguise their names, we would disguise where they came from. So Tenzin is not his real name. Um, so uh, that, that was the idea 
that we had. And we, I went to the, my bosses and I said, this is what I'd like to do. And they said, well, it sounds a very interesting idea, but uh, are you sure you're going to be able to achieve it? We sent a researcher over to <coughs> Nepal and he talked to mountaineering people, uh, mountaineering companies. Um, everything that we looked at, it seemed feasible with a fair wind. We also went to, uh, we had um, somebody go to Dharamsala and make sure that we had the uh, office of, of the Dalai Lama's permission to do it, if they thought it was a good idea. And we were able to obtain a, a letter from the Dalai Lama's office to show to refugees saying, these are good guys, do go with them if you, uh, if you think it's a good idea, but it's your choice. So um, the other thing we said is we would not show any of the refugees. If we filmed any refugees and then they, they uh, wanted to go back into Tibet, we, wouldn't, uh, we would uh, scrub the film. We wouldn't use that uh, part of the film at all. So we, we hoped that um, we, would, um, we would avoid any difficulty that either the individuals we filmed or their families might have. And in fact, we, I'm glad to say we did, but um, anyway. So we wanted to, to do this. Um, the other thing I, I, we discovered is that a third of the people who do climb over the mountains are children. Their parents want to get children, their children out so that they can have a life outside Tibet. And even babes in arms get carried over the mountains as well. I heard several cases of that. So actually, to make um, Escape from Tibet, the film, uh, we would actually have to film illegally, and it's on, uh, at times undercover in, in three countries, in Tibet, in Nepal, and India. In Nepal and India, we, we, we would not have been able to get permission to make film a film about Tibetan refugees because it's a very sensitive subject and they don't want to offend the, uh, the Chinese at all. So we actually said we were making a film about something else, about Buddhism. So uh, it was extremely risky uh, because if we'd been caught at all uh, in any of those countries, we'd have been uh, deported and the film would have been confiscated. Um, and also, uh, uh, being at uh, high altitudes, uh, filming there was going to be difficult on the border, and there might even be Chinese border guards with these long-range rifles up there. Um, but I went to the bosses, and to their great uh, credit, they gave us the go-ahead, so we, we left for Nepal before they could change their minds. <laughs> At the same time we were travelling to Nepal, uh, Pasang and Tenzin had left their home in a remote corner of northern Tibet and had joined a group of escapers that had started the perilous climb up the other side of the Himalayas. And on one of the highest passes at 6,000 metres, about 29, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 20,000 feet, near Mount Everest, the group uh, looked over and saw what they thought were Chinese border guards uh, with a, a tripod with a gun on them about to shoot them but in fact it wasn't it was a uh, film crew my film crew from uh, from England and they were the first Westerners that uh, the 11 year old Tenzin had seen and at that point the shooting began but with the camera not the gun and, um, and it was the moment that uh, they left Tibet and uh, the moment that changed their lives. Uh, we, uh, we met up on the border um, and uh, continued to film them and it actually all worked out as our research um, dictated and um, there's, there's a couple of shots here of the boys. This is actually them in Lhasa before we met them. Uh, they had to cross to Lhasa, uh, across uh, Tibet, across the uh, Tibetan plateau, which is an enormous distance, uh, which they did. Uh, as you see, the elder brother, Pasang, was a, a novice monk at the time, and that tends in, that's your, isn't that your uh, school uniform? Yes. Your school uniform, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, there they are on the top of the mountain. And there's little Tenzin there. What were you, what were you wearing at the time? Were you... uh, a little jacket and a, perhaps a shirt inside and then a quilt around my neck. And a, just one layer of trousers, I suppose. What about shoes? What are your shoes? Shoes were uh, uh, like a basic shoes uh, designed to uh, uh, wear in the streets uh, in the summer, not in the winter or uh, mountaineering in the snowy uh, Himalayas. Okay. And uh, what, what happened to you? You, you got ill, didn't you? Yeah, I, um, what happened was that uh, <clears throat> because of the cold and the, uh, the harsh, uh, the white of the snow, I, I became snow blind. And uh, for one week, I struggled to actually uh, to, you know, struggle to see anything in, that, in any for any any degree of clarity. And in the first few days, uh, I had to be led. I had to be uh, sort of uh, uh, led by the hand. And uh, it basically played on my psyche a lot because I, I was fearing that uh, I may not be able to see. And uh, I, I learned that uh, quite a few of the other people had experienced a similar thing, but. Uh, it hit uh, on me uh, quite severely because uh, uh, I, was a, I was a bit uh, more fragile than the grown-up adults. But the, the other thing was uh, uh, my feet were uh, bruised and injured because of the, uh, uh, what, what do they call them, uh, frostbite. Frostbite, and, uh, yeah. And basically just uh, shoe, shoe soles, the rubber shoe soles uh, tearing open. Yeah holes and stones friction feet. So we were able to observe this and um, and it's a, a, a principle of sort of ethnographic filming that you, what you try and do is observe something that was real that was happening rather than set it up or anything like that and of course this was quite difficult uh, for us because we were we were seeing these people who were suffering um, you had very little to eat, didn't you? It was a uh, problem. I mean, we uh, we had already walked uh, from within the uh, uh, within the places in Tibet where uh, transportation would no longer be a, a good idea because the military would be able to uh, detect you if you travelled on transport. So we had already walked more than a week. We'd run out of food. We were like. Uh, uh, Russian. We, we only each carry about five kilos of grains and powder, uh, grains and flour. Uh, which is why when we went to the top of the mountain, we begged uh, for, uh, from the TV crew for food. Yeah, and I think there was an instance when uh, you discovered the researcher's <laughs> stash of chocolate, I have to say. But, uh, but as you can see, it was, it was quite difficult. We, one, of the, one of the refugees did fall down. And, uh, and uh, severely injured his head, and we were able to uh, supply the uh, bandage, weren't we, to, uh, to help, it was, to help it was, um, If you hadn't done that, they would have uh, torn off uh, somebody else, somebody's clothes, yeah. jacket, or, yeah. and they would have done that, something similar. Anyway, we continued to film them uh, up in the mountain, and then they came down into the, the valleys to Kathmandu, and uh, the the thing was, we could only film sporadically. We couldn't stay with them all the time. So we, because um, uh, we could go into the villages, they couldn't go into the villages for fear of uh, for finding police, uh, uh, Nepalese police, who would uh, quite possibly send them back over the mountain. So um, uh, the, the, it was quite a difficult um, logistical problem to try and keep in contact with the group of refugees that we were filming, but we did manage to film them all the way through the, uh, the processes through uh, Kathmandu where you met the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and then on through into Delhi and to Dharamsala. But actually um, we, we, followed, we followed them and uh, this, this is a shot of uh, a little boy, a little 11 year old boy, a little Tenzin, when um, because they, they were rejected by the UNHCR in Kathmandu. So Prasang, the elder brother, decided to go ahead anyway and cross with the rest of the group who had kind of bonded. 
Uh, but you'd, got, you'd reached Dharamsala, but I think at this point you were told that you would have to go back over the mountains, that you would not be able to stay in India because of the agreement between the Tibetan government in exile and the Indian government meant that people, uh, refugees, had to have a United Nations refugee status, and you didn't have it. So at this point, uh, you would have to go back over the mountains. And it was only with the intervention of the, uh, of the Dalai Lama himself that uh, uh, meant that you could stay in India. Uh, and this was the uh, scene from the audience with the Dalai Lama um, that uh, we managed to film. And there's uh, Pasang, and there's the old guy. I mean, he kept saying he was an old guy. He was 38 years old, apparently. Uh, he, he was the one who had the, the head injury. And there were two younger girls. Uh, there's, this one ended up in the United States of America, and this one in, uh, actually ended up in London, where she, we, she's, she is still. Um, and uh, so we, we uh, continued filming with them. And that, that's uh, uh, Tenzin meeting the Dalai Lama, although we don't have them both in the same shot. I promise you that is the Dalai Lama's arm. <laughs> This is holy arm. Okay. Then they uh, they followed that by um, uh, going down to the a monastery, staying in a monastery, living in a monastery in southern India, um, where the older one Pasang became a, a monk, and little Tenzin was trained as a uh, novice monk. And they were there for five years, but at the same time. The film went out, and when the film went out, it was shown uh, on British television, and subsequently on television in 40 countries around the world. But also, perhaps more importantly, it was shown by the uh, shown at the State Department, a special screening at the State Department at the House of Commons in London, um, in the United Nations uh, in the Geneva, and uh, at the White House where Hillary Clinton saw it before she did a, uh, she went to Nepal, apparently. And um, so I don't know if, if, I don't think it changed anybody's views or influenced policies, but it might have helped to inform people about, about the situation within Tibet. So, um, uh, but as a result of the film, uh, a lot of viewers wrote in and they sent money and they sent, uh, they, they sent chocolate, which is, uh, <laughs> they sent all sorts of things. And, and uh, I went out to, a couple of years later, to see the boys in the, in the uh, monastery in, in southern India. And then two sponsors in, in London who'd seen the film uh, decided that they would sponsor them to come to England. And uh, so they did come to England. Um, First of all, they, uh, uh, I, I went over and um, got them the visas. This is outside the British High Commission in Delhi. The moment we got the visas, and it took a, a week to do it, but as you can see, they're very happy. There's, uh, Denzin has grown up a bit by now. Um, they're very, very happy about it, and um, it was on a, a very cold November day that they came to London. and. Um, they, uh, uh, they've lived in London ever since. After uh, a couple of years, you've got the right to remain as victims of torture. And then, uh, after five years or so, they got British passports, which has meant that they are able to go back to see their mother in, in Tibet. Um, and... Uh, Tenzin is a bit of a techno whiz, actually, a bit of a techno whiz these days. And he was able to show his mother his escape from Tibet, the film, on, on a mobile phone. Which has, has impressed his mother, anyway, very much indeed. Impresses me as well. Um, so, when I first uh, met Tenzin, none of us could communicate with him. He only spoke the dialect of his little part of uh, Tibet. Uh, only his brother could understand him. He couldn't speak Tibetan. And um, 
But now, as you see, he, can, he speaks English. But you also, what are the other languages you speak? Uh, Japanese, Mongolian, Hindi, and, and Tibetan. And Tibetan. That's fantastic. That's great. And Koki. The Koki. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give you a little bit of a background on Tenzin here. Uh, this is a picture of him aged 11, uh, which was taken in a studio, was it? A studio near your, in a, a town near your home. Is that right? This, this yeah, picture? This was near, uh, this actually in, in uh, Lhasa, to be honest. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, right. So, w when you were with Pasak? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, you got some photographs no photograph to, show, to show to your mother? Uh, no photographs of me were uh, ever taken. In, <coughs> near my oh, right, okay. I got that bit wrong, haven't I? Right. Right, this is, this is his village. Um, and it's right on the, the edge, the northern edge of the plateau. Uh, at what sort of altitude is it? Uh, over here it would be like uh, 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet, yeah. If you go uh, towards the uh, west, west of Tibet, it increases like uh, to... Uh, uh, 16, 17. Uh, so the average uh, Tibetan plateau uh, elevation is uh, 15,000 feet. So you can see the, the village is sort of these low lying houses, <coughs> all of which have courtyards, uh, and they, you keep the, uh, the animals in there in the. Yeah, the, the, the bits of things that are attached to the uh, walls with plastic things, that they're for pigs. And over here, on the mountain slope, you can see the sheep. Yes, you looked after the sheep, didn't you? <laughs> but they also have these ornate uh, doorways, which are typical of the... Well, I have to tell you, these are metallic doors that are actually recent developments. Back then, they, uh, everybody had wooden doors. But the, the doorways, the brick doorways, which are rather ornate, aren't they? It's kind of, yeah, local style. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, this this was the this is where you were brought up, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, you had pigs in there and things like that, didn't you? Pigs, and cows, and you know a couple of horses, uh, about really? twenty sheep or thirty sheep. Very cozy in winter. <laughs> and there's uh, his his mother and uh, your younger uh, youngest brother. Yeah. Um, but as I said, the, um, uh, the language they spoke was uh, called Hokkai, and is a, um, it's, not a, it's not a written language, it's just a spoken language, because the writing has been lost, uh, but it is only preserved on, this is the um, doorway of one of the monasteries, and this in fact, apparently is the... Is the uh, it's a stylized... Uh way of writing the script, yeah. Yeah, but nobody can read it. Uh, some of the uh, well-trained uh, priests uh, probably can uh, decode uh, these various symbols and t tell a bit about what they mean. But uh, apart from the couple of priests, and, uh, no one else would know. It would be like a... Uh, it would be available for, withdraw for retrieval in a certain little uh, booklet if you're going to go and uh, decorate the doorways uh, in the future. So some monasteries will have a, a, a retrieval, a little booklet uh, for this, but not the entire language. The entire script has been uh, sort of lost or uh, is not, 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 not readily given for uh, access. Right, and, uh, and of course it's disappearing and people are uh, having to use uh, Chinese, so they're losing, losing their... Um, uh, losing this language. I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking uh, Tenzin and uh, Nick for really interesting discussion. Um, so thank you very much.